So if you're like me, finding a place to eat is really never an easy thing to do, especially when you're trying to travel and you're outside of your hometown. And like with me, I'm over here in Hampton Roads. And not to mention when you're also trying to actually put together like a team building event or something like that. And I always find myself wishing that I had a trusted friend that I could call to tell me where to eat. And that friend has now become a company called Infatuation. And the Infatuation helps you find the right restaurant for any situation. If you need a place for a first date, trying to find a spot for your birthday that you don't want to celebrate, except you kind of also want to do it too, the infatuation has you covered in all of these situations and many, many more. So if you ever need a place to eat but don't want to read through thousands of unreliable crowdsourced reviews, hit the infatuation.com or download the free app for iOS and Android to search thousands of restaurant reviews and guides in 22 major cities around the world. Or let the infatuation do the work for you by sending a text to 64560, that's 64 or 560 and a real person will respond and help you find a restaurant that's perfect for whatever situation you find yourself in. I'd like to welcome you to the first episode of the Best Practices in Human Resource podcast. I'm here to help you take the guesswork out of understanding the human resource component and push through the ambiguity of this changing landscape. I'm Brenda, your host and a 20-year human resource professional. I've seen a lot of different things done a lot of different ways, and I'm here to help you weed through that abyss of human resource information and help take out the stress of defining your best practice. So who is this podcast for? Well, really, it's for anyone who's in a position of managing human capital in a micro, small, or growing business. Um, there's a great deal of compliance that needs to be met, and having that information and the guidance to implement it every month is key. So I want to thank you very much for joining me today. So in this episode, we're going to talk about um, introducing you to the actual best practices company, which is a virtual tour of the, the consulting side of my world what exactly are best practices. We're going to learn a little bit more about that. I've got some state legislative announcements that are going to be coming out, changes for 2019. Also, updating you guys on IRS pension plan limitations 419 as well. Changes for FSA adoptions and commuter benefits that are coming in the new year. And then also some give you some free resources, two to be specific, very powerful and useful that I'm excited to share with you a little bit later on. Before we go forward, though, um, I do want to just kind of set an expectation here and give you guys some information that whatever you gain through this podcast is for informational purposes only and really cannot be for the purpose of providing legal advice. If you have a particular issue, make sure that you contact your attorney to obtain legal advice with respects to that issue. Um, if you don't have an employment attorney, you're welcome to reach out to us and we may, we'll do what we can to help refer you to one through our affiliates program. So we do have access to different resources that um, we may be able to help tap into across the United States. So as a company, <clears throat> what is best practices? Well, we're a small human resource consulting practice that provides sound and experienced guidance to help take that angst out of not knowing what to do or if what you're doing is the right thing or not. Um, our focus is on micro organizations, micro meaning anywhere from one to that 10 employee benchmark. Uh, small businesses really are kind of 10 and on up into 50. And then and well, it can even be more than that. Small, I mean, there really is kind of no specific identified benchmark. What defines, um, you know, a small business versus medium? So, um, and then not to mention individual practitioners as well. I mean, you know, when you're only one person deep in an organization and you don't have the luxury of having another HR business partner on hand or another, you know, credentialed practitioner, you don't have the ability to really talk to somebody and, and to think through, okay, so here's my issue, here's the background on it, what am I missing? And those things are very, very important, not to mention when we're in that collaborative mindset as practitioners um, in the field of human resources, you, you've got somebody who's kind of walked the walk with you. So you guys are welcome to reach out to us. Um, you can visit us at our website, that's the best place to start 
bestpractices.work is our website. Uh, you're welcome to read our blogs, you know, register for our complimentary webinars on our events page, which we're really excited about. Uh, listen to these podcasts because there's going to be a bunch of information that's going to be coming out. But again, most importantly, go ahead and book that time to talk. You know, we have very reasonable rates. You can set an appointment for 20, 40, or 60 minutes, and everything is done easily online. So you identify what date and what time. Go ahead and plug your payment information in, and you'll be able to talk to a credentialed professional. We also have a growing affiliates program that is designed to provide 360 degrees of supporting human resource functionality. So that's continuing to grow. Look for some really good things that are coming out of that. So what exactly is a best practice? Well, a best practice as we're defining it is a series of repetitive actions which produce a positive end result. It's something that is designed to help you keep compliant under specific employment laws and it cons it, it's just, they're consistent actions in the application of human resource deliverables. So short version, <clears throat> it's working smarter, not harder in the HR realm. <laughs> That's the best way you could describe it. Okay, so changes in legislation. So it's been, you know, this time of year gets really active. So there's two different times of the year where we really start to see a lot more movement on the legislative side when it comes to employment law and that is at the end of the calendar year and then again towards the mid-year and and part of it has to deal with one it's easy just to flip a calendar from December to January and boom you got a new law right but then there's other times where mid-year implementation of a particular law can come out of a particular state's legislative activities like General Assembly, changes that are made, um, you know, mid-year. So this is definitely one of the most popular times of the year where these changes are coming out. So there's a couple of states that have announced some pretty big changes. So first off, Missouri. So Missouri's actually passed a minimum wage increase for the state. So if you have not yet known or identified what that is, you know, definitely you're going to want to dial into that. Also, Missouri had a, made a, a approved amendment number two, which adds an article to the Missouri Constitution that legalizing medical use of marijuana for qualified patients and permitting an avenue for citizens to qualify and gain permission to grow their own plants. Now, we're not here to advocate yay or nay. This is a very neutral platform when it comes to that. What we're here is to identify how a business can actually work through the minutia on this and when you're talking about marijuana in general how it impacts state law federal law government contractors first and foremost it's a moving target very few people are really wanting to touch it but at the end of the day employers what does it mean for you guys what does it mean to have individuals working on your promise your your premises your business you know, dealing with your clients where they are free and clear-headed. Um, also, you know, in the realm of government contracting, you still have to abide by the Drug-Free Workplace Act of 1988. So what do changes in the state like this mean? So, you know, if you have questions you want to talk, by all means, come find us. You know, we're here to help you out. Now, the next state update that we have for you guys today is taking place out of Kentucky. The state Supreme Court recently upheld Kentucky's right to work law. And right to work simply means that an individual can become employed with a company that has a union and not be required to actually join that union and contribute to union dues. So that's a big move, uh, especially being that it's coming down from the, uh, the state Supreme Court. Um, there's also something that you'll hear in relation to a state which is called employment at will. And employment at will is different than right to work. Employment at will simply means that an employee uh, can continue to work for an organization with and be dismissed with or without notice, cause, or reason, either an, an action that's taken place on behalf of the employee, so the employee can resign with or without notice at any particular time, but that can also relate to 
what's on the employer side as well. The employer can go ahead and terminate an employer with or without reason. Something to keep in mind though when it comes to employment at will um, is that it's also layered by different types of laws, meaning that it's not really as strong as it once was 10, 15, 25, 20 years ago. So, um, you know, before you execute any type of at will decision, make sure that you're thoroughly looking at those different types of situations. But anyway, back back to right to work. Um, so new changes that are coming down from that, when say new changes, they're just upholding it. So for those of you that are in Kentucky um, and looking at unionization or involved in unionization, that's a major development for you guys. Finally, today we've got California. There's always changes going on in California. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> January 1st is going to mark a significant number of new laws that are going to be taking a effect for different types of protections for both employers and employees. These things are going to include um, anti-harassment laws that address that addresses certain concerns that have really stemmed from the Me Too movement that we've seen take place over time and furiously I might add. Um, also there's going to be a number of different type of clarifying hiring practices within these the laws that are being released surrounding things like equal pay, criminal history inquiries, uh, board of directors requiring gender inclusion, anti-harassment training requirements, requesting payroll records, lactation accommodations, paid leave extensions for family members of our military, and finally uh, information surrounding hiring minors, different changes in public, uh, public employment law, and industry specific changes that are coming down the pike as well. So understanding what to do next when it comes to things like this becomes incre increasingly important, especially if you have an employees in these particular states. If you'd like to learn how to best move forward with these laws, contact us and we'll be able to help answer your questions, provide some best practice recommendations, and help point you in the right direction if you need legal guidance. Uh, you, again, you can visit our website and submit your request at bestpractices.work backslash reserve. All right, so the 2019 IRS ERISA pension plan limitations, um, that's going to be next we're going to be talking about. And the plan administration in general, any plan administration in general, is just as much an HR function as it is a financial function. And these two elements overlap consistently. So where there's a change in rates, it impacts finance. It impacts the employee as well, but it also impacts finance because those are things that we have to budget for. Conversely, when something changes on the financial side, it, Im it can impact the employee. So, you know, finding, you know, collaborative efforts between the finance department and HR department and or individuals is is very very important but today we're really going to talk about and help you guys to understand a little bit more about specifically the 415 D and what the the 415 D is in relation to this it's an IRS code that limits the amount of benefits that may be paid to a participant in a defined benefit plan it also limits the amount an employee may contribute under that particular defined contribution as plan as well it's a requirement of the United States Secretary of the Treasury to adjust these limits annually in order to address different changes in the cost of living. A link to these changes can be actually found on our website under, the, under our blog page titled Secretary of Treasury Adjust Pension Plan Limitations for 2019. So, okay, so what does that exactly mean for you guys? Well, if you're a plan sponsor or a plan administrator, make sure that you're speaking with your plan fiduciary, trustees, financial management team, trust company, and or compliance teams to identify specifically what changes need to take place for your organization. That's very important. Make sure that you're communicating to your employees the changes in the program offering that will recur as a result of the 415D updates. Now, I'm going to throw a best practice out at you here. Don't get into the weeds too much on what you communicate. And what I mean by that is only communicate what the employees actually need to know and that is the change in the limits that will impact them for the upcoming year. If you get too in the, too in the weeds or in the fray on why these things take place, 
you know, the construction of it, when it was released, who all was involved, you're, you're basically making things very confusing for your employees. So basically the only thing they need to know is this has changed, <clears throat> here's the impact of it, and what it is that they need to do. So here's what's coming down the pike next in relation to other types of benefits for 2019. So we've got the ERISA 415D adjustments that are in place, but there's also changes that are happening for FSA adoption and commuter, ben commuter benefits that are, are coming out as well. So the first one is specifically around medical FSA maximum annual limit allowances. This is actually changing from twenty six from $2,650 to $2,700 annually. And basically what that means is that's the maximum that the employee is allowed to com uh, contribute to a medical FSA plan. The next that's also coming down is an adoption assistance uh, limit for 2019, which may now not exceed $14,080. This is an employer provided benefit if it's a benefit that your organization has where the maximum amount executable from an employee's taxable income. That's what this is. There are several exclusions and inclusions to this benefit and you're best served really speaking with your CPA about an adoption assistance program before proceeding with its implementation or placement within your uh, benefit design itself. Lastly, uh, this particular benefit is most beneficial to areas where you've got a large populace, mass transit, and this is specifically surrounding commuter benefits. So the commuter benefit maximum monthly pre-tax benefit allows employees to pay for their own mass transit and workplace parking costs through an employer-sponsored salary deferral benefit plan. These expenses that are available or that are covered or inclusive include the value of mass transit passes, parking, and different types of pooling services. So again, some changes and some benefits uh, that will definitely help with your organization. But if you haven't yet spoken to your broker regarding the changes with the FSA and commuter benefits, make sure you give them a call and make sure you get a chance to walk and talk through those things. If you're not aware of it, you still got time before the end of the year to make some of these things happen. The practice of human resources doesn't have to be as arduous as it may appear. In the short time that we've been together today, we've weeded through a few topics that make the landscape of human resources a moving target. Uh, we're here to help you define your gold standard in human capital management. We're here to help you solve complex problems that come with employment challenges and managing your people and definitely help you keep in the know on these current or developing changes in the employment landscape. So freebies, freebies, freebies. I, I promised you earlier in the show today that we have two free resources for you. So first, mark your calendar. On Tuesday, December 4th, we are hosting a free webinar called Kicking Off Successful New Year. It starts at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we will be providing some of the best practices to help you kick off a successful 2019 for both you and your employees. If you can't make the webinar, it's all right. It will be available on demand, but you'll still need to register ahead of time. So you can find this information by going to our website at bestpractices.org backslash events or new dash events. Or if you just go to the website, click on events, you'll get there. Um, again, that's Tuesday, December 4th, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Register for some good tips and some helpful, uh, you know, best practices on how to get 2019, 2019 off to a really great start. Second, we know how confusing it is to keep track of all of this information and these compliance details that are required in this field and, and is basically on how to find the time to engage in them and all the other practices that, you know, HR has to make fit together. So we've created an HR calendar for 2019 that lists all the compliance deadlines to relieve that tension of having to figure these things out for yourself. The calendar includes mandatory filing dates, nationally recognized holidays, as well as a couple of other best practice recommendations kind of sprinkled in there as well. It's a bunch of compliance information that's consolidated onto one page. Print it, pin it up in your bulletin board in your office, keep it in your tickler files, have it next to you, load your you know Outlook calendar or whatever calendar you're using, and use that as a tool to help you keep all of the parts and pieces of the HR puzzle connected. 
to download this free tool, visit our website at bestpractices.org and click on the link at the bottom of the home page. If you're struggling with a particular HR issue, look, reach out to us. We're here to help you be successful. This is what we do, okay? Best place to start, again, hit the website up. Definitely spend some time, schedule a call with us, and request a needs analysis meeting to identify